well. All right, that's enough for announcements. If you have your Bibles, please open them to the Gospel of Luke. We're going to be in gospel, uh, the Gospel of Luke chapter 16. We've been going through this Gospel for a long time, but I want to give a little bit of a preface to that this morning, speaking to our current moment. I asked this question last week. Um, I'm going to ask it again, even though, again, I can't really get a response, but I mean it. Uh, the question is, how are you doing? Honestly, how are you doing? Um, you could let us know, by the way, by texting or emailing or uh, calling us. Um, we do have places on our website where you can contact us. We would like to know. I would like to know so that we can pray for you and, and encourage you. Um, I had the opportunity, as I've just mentioned, uh, with our small group, our community group, up in the Highlands to gather together uh, over um, uh, Zoom we used, actually, at that time. And it, it was a really incredible thing. And I want to encourage you in the same way. Text people, phone people, FaceTime people. Uh, people need encouragement, and you do as well. And so I'm sure that most of you who are watching today, at least the people I speak to, are feeling just a little overwhelmed um, by what's going on, and um, maybe a little uh, anxious, and maybe also uh, experiencing fear. I was really blessed by the songs that Anna picked for our singing today, where <laughs> really speaking into that, uh, because the, the, the truth is, is that in Christ, we have no fear. He, perfect love, which Christ has brought to us from the Father God, casts out all fear. And so we need to turn to him. So I, I want to encourage you uh, specifically in a couple of ways as uh, we read God's word today. And the first is this. I, I do this on a repeated basis anyway here on Sundays, but I'm going to do it again. I want to encourage you, now that you're home, most of you should be and are at home, read your Bibles, open the word of God together in your home, with your wife, with your family, with your kids, with your family. And if you're by yourself, FaceTime somebody and read the Word of God together and bless one another with the Word of God. And secondly, as I've said, check in with one another. And, and can I encourage you, especially uh, with those who we know don't have a family in Squamish and particularly the elderly in our church or in our community, listen, it, it will be an encouragement to them. It will be a comfort to them. And I'll tell you what, it'll be an encouragement to you too. But may I make one suggestion? Let's not talk about COVID-19 when we're doing that. Let, let's talk about the Word. Let's talk about what God is doing in our lives, and let's talk about all those blessings. So don't focus on that. One uh, other preface, actually, I got a couple before we dive into the Word today. Earlier this week, I ran into one young man in our church, and he was like six feet from my, my truck window, which was awesome. And we were talking, and, and, he, and he said to me, he goes, you know, uh, Actually, Glenn, you know, I just realized, but my generation, his generation, has never dealt with something like this. Never dealt with something that other generations have dealt with like this. And, and I got to tell you, I was really glad to hear him say that. And the reason for that is because it's true. It's very, very true. I want to suggest to you that what's happening today is this generation's most significant reality check. And how you deal with it and how you learn from it will shape the rest of your lives and the lives of all of those around you. I remember well, actually, when I was seven years old. It was a long time ago. It was 1962, and I came home from school one day, and Dad was home from work early, which was unusual. Both mom and dad were in the living room watching our black and white TV, 1962. And uh, what really concerned me was that mom was crying. My mother was crying. They were watching Walter Cronkite on the, I believe, NBC or ABC US News. Um, and, and what happened from that day and for the next 13 days was that that television was on the news almost every day and there was fear in our house. I was eight years old, seven years old, and I still remember it. I remember the fear that my mother had. Why were they in fear? Well, Soviet leader Nikita Khrushchev and Fidel Castro had enacted a plan to build multiple ballistic missile silos in Cuba. And, and they were in, at loggerheads with the newly elected president of the United States, John F. Kennedy. For 13 days, we came as close to a nuclear holocaust as I can remember. That was scary. 
Then came the Gulf War in 1990-91, and that was an interesting time because uh, I had a chain of stereo stores in downtown Toronto, and again, if you're under 35 here today or watching here today, you don't remember these things. Uh, this, is, uh, this, is, this happened before your time. But there was the Gulf War. It broke out, and there was Saddam Hussein, right? And, and it was spreading all over the news that he was, they were looking at the spelling of his name, and did it work, did it work out to 666? I mean, there was talk about Babylon being rebuilt, and, and Baghdad, and Armageddon. And there was fear of, quite frankly, again, a nuclear holocaust, the Russians were getting involved, America, Israel was, of course, the focus of Saddam Hussein's uh, vile hatred. There was a young man who worked for me, whose name I won't mention, but he was not a believer, but he knew I was, and he was often coming to me and going, can we go for lunch? <laughs> and all he wanted to talk about was, like, is, is this what the Bible says? And there was fear in a lot of people, not just about the potential of a, a world war, but there was fear that maybe this was the end. Maybe this was the end. So friends, let me try to encourage you today that in all of these circumstances, in today's, if you are in Christ Jesus, you have nothing to fear. Nothing to fear. Perfect love, as I already said, casts out all fear. So now as we look at this text, I'm going to confess to you once again that earlier this week, actually throughout the week, <laughs> I had spoken to the elders, I think on Thursday night, and I was waffling back and forth, should I do this text? I don't, you know, like maybe, it, maybe it's better that we take a pause and do a real pastoral, comforting sermon about how to get through all of this together, and I really, really was struggling. I'd prepared this text, I was looking at others, done an outline of another, and then yesterday morning during our devotions, uh, Janice and I were praying about it, and it became really, really clear to me that no, uh, we, should, we should do this parable of Jesus today. And one of the thoughts that I had re related to that was pretty simple. I mean, on this day that Jesus gives this parable to his disciples, I, mean, I just want you to imagine the context. It's, it's, it's under the rule of a very oppressive, mean, angry Roman government. Most of these people who are listening to Jesus are Jewish. They're not being treated well. Uh, they are living in a day and age where Double A's, but they're, they're back on now. But yes, I'm out of batteries. Hang on one sec. <laughs> there should be some in the back there. These are things you would think we would check. Awesome. <laughs> cool. But just so you know, that was my responsibility to check that this morning, just if anyone is wondering. So I, I'm thinking, as, uh, as I was mentioning, that you know, Jesus is, is, is preaching this parable, this teaching, into that particular time and place when the, el the, uh, the disciples are probably thinking, hey, um, what else could you say and teach to us that would be comforting? So I want to encourage you today that it is the Holy Spirit of God. Jesus is the one who's giving this story and this parable to us today. He meant it as an encouragement and, and as teaching that would be uh, profitable for his disciples. And I believe the Holy Spirit feels the same way for you and I here today. Just on that note, before I read the text, Rudy and I were speaking this week, and we, we also felt that what we would be doing throughout the week is, and we plan to start on Tuesday, is we will be doing some pastoral devotions on Facebook Live starting on Tuesday. Uh, myself and Rudy on different days will be doing some things, speaking into these things to give you daily encouragement and comfort from God's Word in that way. So, read with me, beginning in chapter 16, verse 1 from the Gospel of Luke. 
this parable of Jesus. It begins in verse 1 with these words. He, Jesus, also said to the disciples, there was a rich man who had a manager, and charges were brought to him that this man was wasting his possessions. And he called him and said to him, what is this that I hear about you? Turn in the account of your management, for you can no longer be my manager. And the manager said to himself, what shall I do? since my master is taking away the management from me. I am not strong enough to dig and I'm ashamed to beg. I have decided what to do so that when I am removed from management, people will receive me into their homes. So summoning his master's debtors one by one, he said to the first, how much do you owe your master? He said, a hundred measures of oil. He said to him, take your bill, sit down and quickly write 50. Then he said to another, how much do you owe? He said, a hundred measures of wheat. And he said to that person, take your bill and write 80. The master commended the dishonest manager for his shrewdness. For the sons of this world are more shrewd in dealing with their own generation than the sons of wealth, so that when it fails, they may receive you into the eternal dwellings. One who is faithful in very little is also faithful in much. And one who is dishonest in a very little is also dishonest in much. If then you have not been faithful in the unrighteous wealth, who will entrust to you the true riches? And if you have not been faithful in that which is another's, who will give you that which is your own? No servant can serve two masters, for either he will hate the one and love the other, or he will be devoted to the one and despise the other. You cannot serve God and money. Let's pray one more time. Yeah, gracious Heavenly Father, again, we thank you for uh, your, your overarching love for us. We thank you, Lord, that you have you've shown us throughout all of history who you are, how great you are. We, we thank you for showing us all the things that you've done, specifically done to redeem us and restore us. We thank you, Lord Jesus, for being the one who came to do that. And we thank you especially, Lord Jesus, for this teaching that you gave to your disciples on that day and you're giving to us today. Your word is timeless. It is the same yesterday, today, and tomorrow. And so, Holy Spirit, we pray that you would teach us wonderful things from this. We pray that you would encourage us, even in this day, at this moment, in this time, that you would encourage us from this word. Show us specifically, Lord, what you want us to take from this today so that we may be blessed in the hearing of your word. And I pray these things in Jesus' worthy name. Amen. So your sermon title for today, as I like to usually give, is Who Will You Serve? And and believe it or not, only two bullet points for today, Uh, although the second one is five lessons on stewardship. So number one is the parable, and then number two are five lessons on stewardship. So let's begin uh, in verses one and two. I'll put them on screen for you, and I'll read them again. In chapter 16, he, Jesus, said to the disciples, there was a rich man who had a manager, and charges were brought to him that this man was wasting his possessions. And he called him and said to him, what is this that I hear about you? Turn in the account of your management, for you can no longer be my manager. So I want to test your memories here this morning. Um, And uh, I know it's going to be a huge test and a big ask, but I want to ask you if you remember something I said back when we began Luke chapter 12. And Jesus used the words saying to his disciples, beware of the leaven of the Pharisees. Do you remember? Yeah, okay, I, I understand, not likely. But what I told you at the time was that chapter 12 was a pivotal turn in the gospel. It it was from this point on, in the beginning of chapter 12, that two things were going to happen. Number one, Jesus was going to turn his face towards Jerusalem, and he was going to begin his walk towards the cross. And, And so at this time, it became imperative to him to do the other thing, which was to prepare, prepare his disciples. He needed to teach them. He needed to prepare them for two things that were coming. 
number one was, of course, his death, burial, and resurrection. His death on the cross. This is something, even though he'd been telling them it was going to happen and repeatedly telling them, I will die, I will be buried, and I will raise again, they still had not put this together. And every time, quite frankly, he brought it up, it just, it just brought more fear into their minds. Secondly, though, he wanted to really teach them and encourage them about the mission that he was calling them to. And that mission was the kingdom of God, the expansion of the kingdom of God. And, and it was going to be, the way that that was going to happen, the way that that was going to expand was through the ministry of the church and every Christian, every disciple making disciples who make disciples. And this is when he began to do that teaching. So his focus has been on them. He's been focusing on teaching them all that they will need to know. But also, he was teaching them to be careful, not to be influenced by the world around them, especially what the prevailing culture was saying about what really led to a happy and to a successful life. But he was also wanting to prepare them for the persecution and the rejection that would come for following him and the rejection that obviously came to him. And so he wanted to prepare them for these things because he believed, Jesus believed, both of these things, the pressure of the culture to to give into the culture's way of seeking happiness and success in this life, but also the persecution and suffering they would go through for being followers and believers in Jesus— He believed that those pressures would ultimately, literally, make them ineffective. And so today, after three consecutive parables, yes, the crowds keep following Jesus in this period, and yes, the Pharisees keep asking him questions, and he responds to them, but his focus is on his disciples. And so today, after three consecutive parables that are directed at the Pharisees, with, of course, the disciples being present and, of course, the lessons being for them and you and I as well, he turns to them and his focus is on them. And again, he turns to his favorite way of doing that, telling a story, a parable. And that's, again, why I think it's so good for us to do this today is because there's another story going on out there, I understand, but maybe we can pause for a moment and just just enter this story. That's what Jesus would want us to do, is come into the story. So the parable opens with the story of a rich man who had a manager. Another good translation of that word manager would be the word steward. So that's a person who's responsible for things that aren't really his or hers and is responsible to look after them and deal with them in a way that would honor the master, in this case, the rich man. So apparently in this story, someone had brought charges or accusations to the rich man, to the owner of these goods, about the manager. And the essential charge is this, we see in the text, that he was wasting the owner's possessions. But as we will see as the story goes on, what he was actually doing was marking the goods up and embezzling funds. He was robbing people as he sold them. And and that's what they brought to the owner, that this manager was embezzling from them. He was charging above and beyond what the goods were really worth. So remember, this this is the story I was thinking about. This is the story of a wealthy man, right, who has a manager. And that would imply that the manager is probably getting a decent wage if he's working for a wealthy man. And yet, and yet, human greed is at work here, and he's looking to make more than enough. And so here's what he do. He he, he basically calls this this dishonest manager before him, and he says, listen, you're fired, okay? Bottom line is you're fired. And listen, before you clean out your desk and your office, I want you to gather all your spreadsheets, bring it together. I want to see where things are at, and then get out. You're fired. Then we read in verse 3, and then the manager said to himself, So he's, this this literally means he's thinking to himself, right? What am I going to do since my manager is taking the manager away from me? I'm not strong enough to dig, and I'm ashamed to beg. Well, he's, again, he's a pretty sharp cookie. He's he's quick on his feet, um, for sure. But but look look how he assesses the situation. 
This is important, what, what this means for him. I mean, he's been fired, and he's going to be unemployed, and, and his biggest concern is, his biggest concern is himself, right? His biggest concern is his own skin. He's thinking, oh man, listen, as soon as this gets out, that I've been fired, all the people that I've stolen from, all the people that I've embezzled from, all the people whose lives I've made more difficult are A, number one, not going to want to allow me into their home. But number two, there's no way in the world that if I wanted to even wanted to work in construction, which I don't, there's no way in the world that anybody's going to give me a job. And secondly, if I was to start begging, good luck with that. Again, so he is clearly just concerning himself with, I thought I lost it here again. Um, he's just concerning himself with himself. So what will he do? Well, again, he's an embezzler, a con man, really. And, of course, he has a plan which is rather brilliant. At least some people might think so. He decides to call in all his matter, master's debtors, and he asks the first one, how much do you owe my boss? And the guy says to him, a hundred jars of EVO. Okay, so I made that up. It's extra virgin olive oil, but a hundred jars of oil, right? And so now look at the, I want you to look at this very carefully uh, because it's possible to miss exactly what's going on. He says to this guy, okay, I'll tell you what you do. Quickly, take the bill or let me take the bill and let's rewrite that bill and adjust it to 50 and call it even. Just pay the bill. So it might look to us on the surface that that's what he's trying to do. Is what he's trying to do is actually get his boss's money back to maybe get his job back. But how's that going to work if he gets back less from everyone that is actually owed? You get it? You see what's going on here? See, what's happened is he actually only sold the first gentleman, the first person, 50 jars of oil, or what was worth 50 jars of oil, but he marked it up 100%. And so he was going to keep the 50% when that bill got paid. And so people knew this. They could see that was happening, and he was going to keep it for himself. And so he goes, goes on and does that with the other. He has 50% more for himself from the first person. It's pretty sneaky. From the second person, he only marks it up 20%. Maybe this person was a pretty good negotiator, but still, he's marking up, and he's taking, skimming off the top. And so it's ingenious. I mean, it was, in those days, it was kind of like, it's the norm. It's like tax collectors. <laughs> this is what happened. I mean, even more so when you think about it, about his first concern, which was that he was despised and not invited to anyone's homes. Now, imagine, having done what he's done and did it this way, who's the good guy in the story now, do you think, amongst the people on the streets? So let's watch this. In verse 8, the master commended the dishonest manager for his shrewdness. For the sons of this world are more shrewd in dealing with their own generation than the sons of light. So first of all, let's see it this way. In the parable anyway, this master is impressed with the dishonest manager, but for what? For getting him his money back? Maybe, but actually the text tells us, no, it's actually for his shrewdness. The, the manager kind of admires it. Sneaky, but shrewd. Not, not the dishonesty in marking things up, but the way that he worked things out. So the master isn't denying that he was a shark, a dishonest embezzler. No, he's impressed that he got his money back for him for sure, but also that he saved his own skin, his own reputation with the very people he'd been ripping off. So at this point, we have to pause and, and we have to remember that, okay, Jesus is the one telling this parable. Sounding a bit odd to you? And, and who the rich man in this story might be, usually parables, we can tell, like last week, the father in the parable was Father God, right? The, the prodigal so story, right? We can tell that. We know who the elder brother, the better elder brother was. It's Jesus. The characters in the parables are usually pretty simple to figure out. This one's a little bit different, so we need to be careful how we go about this. It's caused many to ask, actually, commentators and theologians over the years and 
just people who pick up the Bible and read it for the first time, is what's going on here? Is, it, is Jesus approving of someone who's a dishonest manager, an embezzler? So imagine, of course, the disciples who are sitting there with Jesus listening to the story, right? And, and, and they're waiting, likely, as the Pharisees, as we're going to see, who are still there from a distance. They're waiting for Jesus. They're waiting for Jesus to, to just drop some righteous wrath on this guy and call him out for being what he is, a dishonest manager. Instead, he commends him, or at least the rich man in the story does. He praises him. So what's really going on? Well, it'll become clearer as we go on, but let me say this for now as, as just to set it up because it'll become clearer as we go farther. As we've seen in previous parables, Jesus is always comparing two groups of people, tax collectors and sinners in all of chapter 15, versus... Pharisees and scribes, the religious types. A similar comparison is going on here in this parable. This time it's the disciples, of course, who are made up of sinners and tax collectors, and of course the Pharisees and their attitude towards money in particular. And so we have a comparison as well going on here. Listen, a comparison between a worldly master, a shrewd master in this world who has a dishonest manager, and our manager who is Jesus Christ. And so Jesus is setting up for his disciples and for you and I a comparison for how the world deals with these things versus the way we, those who are in Christ, should deal with these things. So that leads us to the application that Jesus wants his disciples to hear and understand. And as we move to that, I just want to put it to you this way. He wants his disciples, you and I, to be radically challenged in three specific areas as we go forth as his disciples. Number one is in our view of who God is. Who God is. Secondly, our view of our wealth, which includes our money and our possessions. And and thirdly, our view of what we're to do with that. Our stewardship of what he gives to us. He wants to talk to them about their attitude and their own responsibility to be stewards before God. But in the background, let me remind you, He's also addressing, besides his disciples, these lovely Pharisees, right? They're there. They're lurking. The the very next verse, verse 14, which we'll get into next week, says the Pharisees, who were lovers of money, heard all these things, and they ridiculed Jesus. I want you to remember that because they're going to ridicule him, not for the way he treated or the story treats the dishonest manager. They think that's pretty cool. They do. No. No. It's the five lessons on stewardship that he's going to give you and I and his disciples that follow that they ridiculed Jesus for. So point number two, five lessons on stewardship. Let's look at the first found in verse 9. And Jesus says, I tell you, make friends for yourselves by means of unrighteous wealth so that when it fails, they may receive you into the eternal dwellings. So right away, we, we can see he's told the story the parable of this person, and now he's at the table or in a, in a huddle with, with his, his 12 and probably more, and he's, he says, I tell you. So he's looking them in the eye now, so this is, here's the application, here's the lesson I want you to hear, and here's the first lesson. You have, and, and, and I want to point out, you have to hear and read this in the idiom that they did. It, it, it's kind of in the negative to bring us to the positive is the way it's done, and it's the the idiom of the day. So Jesus' point is this. Look, you can see from this story that the dishonest manager used his position, his wealth, and his possessions to, listen, gain earthly or worldly dwellings. In other words, to gain more of what the world has to offer for himself. You, on the other hand, need to do this. You, being my disciples, should do the very opposite. You should use all of your earthly wealth and possessions and positions and life, for that matter, to gain eternal dwellings. There's the comparison. So he's comparing the Pharisees, and and they all knew this. They all knew this in that culture in that day. These were the ones who lined their pockets from the tithes and offerings, right, and the usury that they put on people, they tried to make it look like they were being good, you know, priests and good ministers to the people, you know, really pastoring and shepherding them well. 
But the reality is, is they were only using it for their own personal gain. And not only their personal gain financially, these were wealthy religious men, but also their prestige and power in the community. That's what they were using it for. And so Jesus says to his disciples, listen, I want you to use everything that I give to you, all of your wealth, to bless people, to bless others, and to bless me, to bless God. So it's really a, a huge lesson on stewardship for us and fundamental to being a Christian, fundamental actually to being a Christian is to understand that we are stewards. In the beginning, God created the heavens and the earth and then he, he told Adam and Eve, he told our first parents to go, right? And, and go, yes, and, and be fruitful and so forth, but also have dominion to care for, to be stewards of my creation, of everything that I've given to you. Stewardship was given to us from the very beginning. Put another way, fundamental to living our lives as disciples of Jesus is an understanding that all we have, everything that we have, everything we've been given yesterday, today, and tomorrow comes from Him, belongs to Him. And Jesus goes on in lesson number two to show us more about that. In verse 10, He says, And one who is faithful in a very little is also faithful in much. And one who is dishonest in a very little is also dishonest in much. <clears throat> I, I, I love this lesson. I've learned this lesson uh, the hard way a few times. I, I learned a, uh, probably the, the, the lesson best early on in my business career from my favorite mentor, Robert Kojima. Uh, I had lunch with him uh, usually every week to talk about my job. And one day after only working for JVC, the stereo company, for about one year, I was lamenting the Robert, uh, typical young salesperson's lament, you know, if, if, if I had a more important title on my business card, you know, because my business card said sales rep, you know, Southwestern Ontario, and I, I was like, well, if it said sales manager Robert, you know, I'd probably sell more. <laughs> and and uh, Robert was always amazing. He said very funny things to me sometimes, and uh, he, with his Japanese accent, he looked at me on that day, and he just said, grandson? Uh, it, was, it was wonderful. I love the way he put it. He says, what you need to do is you need to learn to produce more with the title you have before you get the better title. I, I was like, really? It's just common sense, isn't it? But by the same token, I think most of us live our lives in this world today. Most of us want to go from warehouse to penthouse rather quickly, right? We, we don't really want to, maybe even in the Christian life, in the Christian walk, Jesus says, my disciples will be known for how faithful they are with the lowest of stations. With what the world deems to be the lowest of positions, and then watch how I will lift you up. He's also saying, watch what I can do with even, even the smallest of your offerings and your tithes and your possessions that you give for the sake of the kingdom. The least of your acts of service. Jesus is saying, if they are given and done for me and for the sake of the kingdom of God, watch will I, what I will do for, with, and through you. Lesson number two, being faithful with a little. Lesson number three is in verse 11. If then you have not been able to be faithful in the unrighteous, if you have not been faithful, pardon me, in the unrighteous wealth, who will entrust you the true riches? This is a very, it's a simple le lesson, actually. Jesus wants his disciples to know, you and I to know, that our use of everything we have, everything we have, including our wealth and material resources, is a spiritual indicator of where our hearts are. He's already talked to us about that. For where your treasure is, your heart where it will be where? Also. He's already taught about that in where? Luke chapter 12, verse 34. He's already talked about that. So this is a great lesson. It's an indicator of what our hearts are focused on and what our hearts are trusting. Does your, does your use of your earthly blessings, wealth, and resources indicate that you're more interested in your eternal dwelling, in your eternal position in Christ, in heaven when you die, or your earthly earthly dwelling. Right now, the present. Again, where is your treasure? 
lesson number four is in verse 12. And if you have not been faithful in that which is another's, oh, this is good, who will give you that which is your own? So again, it's, it's a very simple lesson, and it refers directly back to what we said earlier. And so I want you to look at the verse again, especially the word in which is, in that which is another's. So what is that? The another in this case is our master Jesus, and it takes us back to the heart of stewardship, which is that all that we have is his. Everything we have is actually not ours. Everything we have is his, and it's for us to steward well for him and for the sake of others. So what's his point? Well, his point obviously is your worldly wealth is what? It's that which is another's. Everything that you have, everything that you and I have, is that which is another's. It belongs to somebody else, and he's saying here that if, you're, if you don't rightly understand this and master money, then you're not going to be ready to receive the truly valuable inheritance to come. Our choices, our priorities, all ought to reflect a kingdom agenda in which we have set our eternal values the values we think are most important, on the heavenly riches, not on earthly, on temporary riches. Listen, I I understand in this time and day right now, this might sound like really challenging teaching, but I want to encourage you, Jesus knows that, the Holy Spirit knows that, and it actually is good, good teaching. Because all of us, all of us are probably going to find ourselves stripped back a little bit. So our use of the Lord's wealth is an indicator of what we perceive to be true wealth. And then finally, he gives us lesson number five. Verse 13 says, No servant can serve two masters, for he will either hate the one and love the other, or he will be devoted to the one and despise the other. You cannot serve God and money. I love this verse. Uh, Call me crazy, but I always have. I've always loved this verse. There's several others, like the one I quoted from Luke chapter 12, um, uh, verse 34. For where your heart is, there your treasure will be also. You can put it the other way. Wherever your treasure is, there your heart will be also. I love that. One of the reasons why I love it so much is, is because, in my opinion, it's one of the clearest, it's one of the clearest examples of how honest and truthful Jesus is with us. It's just true. It's simple truth. It's it's the synopsis of all the things that he's been trying so patiently to get across for the last two years to the religious and the irreligious, to to the immoral and the moralistic. It's the synopsis of it. When it comes, basically what he's saying to this, when it comes to faith in God, forgiveness of our sins, and the blessing of eternal life in Jesus, it's either all him or all me or all fill-in-the-blank idol of your choice. It's one or the other. You can't have two masters. So in this parable, Jesus is teaching them, and you and I here today, that for the disciple, the Christian steward, the choice is always, always God and his kingdom first over money, possessions, and anything else. Some of your Bibles might have the, the word money translated mammon, mammon. <clears throat> which, is, which is a great translation. It's actually uh, an allitter- alliteration or a, an English derivation of the Greek word that's used here. And it's, it's actually really good because the full-on Greek word here is not just money. It doesn't just speak to wealth, money-wise, finances. It speaks to also your stomach, your comfort and your ease, your sleep, your sports, What sports? Your pastimes, your worldly riches, your career, your status, your influence, your play, your pleasure. Friends, honestly, let me ask you right now. Is not our current cultural crisis a bit of a wake-up call here? Is not what's going on right now the fact that all of these things, many of these things, need to be stripped away from us? 
Some of us are not only losing jobs and in isolation, does it not feel like all of these earthly blessings and possessions are literally being taken away? It does for me. I feel like that in many, many ways. Friends, what Jesus wants for you and for I is this. He wants you and I to know that the good steward deliberately chooses God over things And he or she also believes this. We believe this. I hope you believe this. God is not a means to an end. God is the end. Everything else is the means. When we die and we go to heaven, it isn't going to be about who we're going to get to see again. It isn't going to be about big mansions and a lovely life and no more sin, death, and it's, yes, it is. No, it's mostly, if not 100%, going to be about him. Him. Being with him. All of him. Well, if it's true that God is a means, not a means to an end, but is the end, everything else is the means, if that is true, and I believe it is, then the words of Pastor Tim Keller, all of you know, who's one of my favorites, will be true for you and I here today in the days ahead. Let me put them on screen for you. He said this, you don't realize that Jesus is all you need until Jesus is all you have. Friends, in the days ahead, I believe, honestly, if all of us were to and are to place our faith and trust in him alone for our salvation and for all of our earthly needs and for our eternal dwelling, then we will truly have no need to fear. I, I, I honestly confess to you, I am going to need to do this much better and much more in the days ahead. But let me also encourage you with this. One of the ways that that's going to be helpful to me and to you And to you is if we go and share this truth with our neighbors today who do not know this truth, do not have this hope. So let's do that. Pray with me, would you?